this uh, all morning trying to come up with a fun fact about myself. <laughs> and it's, uh, I love Steven Universe. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so when I was a teenager, um, I was just interested in a lot of things. And um, I got this subscription to a magazine um, that was just about general everything that teenagers could care about. And uh, in one random um, issue, they featured a little bit of code um, that was a numbers guessing game. And I managed to hack that code into that old computer and it worked and I was like hooked from that point on. I knew like I wanted to solve problems and express myself creatively to, through that. And the only reason I could do that obviously was because I had the privilege of having a computer at home and all these kind of things. So, you know, I, I had a lot of advantages in this journey. But what I want to talk to you about today is how I found myself in this industry and you know what happened during those five years of having a career in there. So I'm uh, Franzi and my pronouns are she or they and I'm Sing Salad on Twitter. I hope you will remember that because I did not put that on every slide. <laughs> but that's fine if you, <laughs> if you forget. Um, yeah, and um, I'm very happy to be here and uh, very honored. So um, I'm an independent contractor. I do software consulting. I run a small community that I'm going to talk about a bit later uh, together with some other great folks. And um, I'm also a speaker at conferences, most of them much different to this one. <laughs> and I'm trying to make the software craftsmanship community where I'm very active in a bit more inclusive, which is not always easy. I have a disclaimer, so this is going to be uh, my perspective, which is flawed because um, I'm white, I'm sort of from an academic background, I'm allosexual, so um, uh, I'm able-bodied and I'm sort of young and there's lots of other privileges that I have, so um, I cannot yeah, talk from those perspectives just for my own. Also I want to make sure that um, people know what to expect, so this won't be a talk telling people how to treat women better in tech, because I feel there's so many talks about it already. It's going to be a very personal experience and what I found that helped me as a marginalized person in tech to survive the toxic environment. So if you are a marginalized person in tech, then you might find something in there. If not, then, you know, sorry. <laughs> this might not have as much for you, but you get to experience something that a lot of people that are marginalized experience, which is that the talks are not made for them. All right, so if you still want some resources on how to help, for example, women in tech, um, there's this great video, How to Supporting Women in Tech by Brian and Vu. So, and there's lots of other stuff. For example, the, all the talks you find on the AltaConf website. All right, so I'm talking about being femme. And this is a label that I've recently adopted because I didn't even understand it before. Um, and I still don't understand it quite well. I just want to make sure that people have, um, my understanding of it is that it's not tied to a gender. So you don't necessarily have to identify as a woman to identify with femme. So it's just uh, about uh, kind of feminine expression. And if you want to know more about that, there's a great auto straddle um, round table on feminists and what different people define as how, why they feel femme. And um, if you look for queer femme assumptions, there's some stuff in there. So for example, because I present femme, feminine, my bisexuality is partly erased. So people assume automatically that I'm more into guys or that I'm actually straight. And um, this is just because how I present. So if I would present more butch, then people would maybe assume that I'm only into women, so there's a kind of problematic with that. So just don't make any assumptions just because someone identifies as femme. All right, so this is kind of a bit of a structure. I want to talk a bit about the history of how I came about in this industry and what I experienced in my journey and um, some of the things I learned which could be useful to you and then how I'm going forward, like what's next. Ooh, I'm being too fast. <laughs> Sorry, translators. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit about the history. When I was growing up, I read lots of stories about powerful heroes, and not a lot of them were women. There was one book that I particularly loved, which um, was uh, about Alana of Trebond, and uh, she 
dressed up as a guy to become a knight. And she sort of blended in, was doing the code switching a lot because she had to pretend to be a guy to do the thing that she loved. And in some ways that influenced me a lot. Um, the masculinity was praised, being, having all these qualities that are assigned to being a man as being great and good and something to strive for. Being highly applauded for being some sort of a tom girl or trying to do things that you know, boys do. So I believe that you know, I could either be smart or pretty. So I chose smart. And I believe that if I spend any time on how I look, that would be a waste. And you know, I, I really rejected those ideas because that's what had been programmed into me. I also was bullied a lot in school and I blamed women for that. So I was like really buying into this bad idea that women are supposed to be fighting each other and against each other and I didn't have any female friends and I basically had internalized misogyny. I hated women and I guess that's part of the reason I didn't discover I was bisexual until I was like 29. So um, I thought that femininity was weak, that it was bad and all these horrible things and I have a lot of patient people in my life that try to slowly deprogram these things and deconstruct these ideas and I particularly want to mention um, some of my feminist friends and also um, Ada Conf that I went to in Berlin. So that was a great experience for me. So all these things resulted into me trying to be not one of those girls. So I, I dressed very much um, androgynous or tried to look more male, like put my hair up in exams because I was told that would make me look smarter um, because it was more male. And it's kind of funny that always when you're trying to be gender neutral, you're looking more masculine. So it was kind of a bit of a problem there. So I also tried to drink as much as the guys, which didn't really work. Um, I didn't, I shouldn't never complain because you know, then I would be like this horrible feminist that would like make claims to things when, you know, I just believe, told myself that I'm, I'm a good, um, good woman and I don't do these things. And I know this is all horrible and I'm really ashamed of it. I just want to tell you like where I was coming from. Right, um, I, I believe the worst thing was I was making sexist jokes. So I'm really ashamed of that, but that happened. And I also believed in this myth that uh, if you were bothered by something, then you just don't have enough thick skin. So this is also something that normalizes microaggressions and really um, takes people off the hook, right? So they, you tell people, oh, you know, you don't have to be responsible for it. <clears throat> okay, so through all these microaggressions that I was experiencing as I was studying computer science, focusing on um, software development in my school and my studies, I slowly started to ha get this feeling that I don't belong. So first experience at school, I went to the computer club and um, the boys just showed me porn to get me to leave. And I just persisted, nevertheless. And, uh, <laughs> and stayed there, you know, <laughs> despite being the only woman and, you know, all my friends were like looking at me like, what are you doing? And um, yeah, so I, I stayed in there and it was not great because the teachers didn't help um, but in the end, I, I sort of made it through and I just thought, this is a great achievement. I can tackle anything now, you know. Um, so this also went on in my career later when um, people just assumed that I was there with my boyfriend to any event or that um, I was not an actual amazing coder, but an agile coach. And this is, by the way, agile co coaches are undervalued. So. I'm going to get to that a bit later. But basically, people were putting me in that corner where they believed a woman belongs. Did we lose the connection? Keep okay. going. Okay. So, um, we already talked about this. Also, my emoji vanished. That's really sad. But there was an eye roll emoji there. <laughs> <laughs> so, a lot of the time I get this, someone says, hey, guys. Then I look at them. And they go like, and girls. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm so sorry. And then they start apologizing. And they're like, I'm really getting better at this, you know. And then they're like, actually, it's gender neutral. And um, then I said, no, it's not. But let's have the discussion another time. Oh, but it is in America. And I was like, no, <laughs> just no. And the problem is, like, 
it I just always puts the burden on me to try to ex like validate that they're trying, right? To give them like a gold star. So no. <laughs> Um, the other thing that I experienced was people telling me, oh, you're weird, like, what are you doing? Like, this must be so hard, you know, um, why are, did you choose computer science? Why are you doing software development? And I kind of retreated more and more into myself and tried not to make any noise and tried to not be visible because whenever I, vi I was visible, I was getting these things. And it was really not my personality, <laughs> so <laughs> that, that clashed with that. So slowly, I grew some realizations um, and I understood more, and um, I lost this myth that if I just worked hard enough, I could achieve anything, because there were things that were working against me and this whole system that we are working in. So, um, how a difficult setting, we know that all the, a lot of us know this metaphor, that of course um, I, I could achieve the same things, but it was much harder for me, and always had to do this code switching, which was taking a lot of energy. So learning something about feminism gave me more the ability to look behind things and not buy into these ideas, and that made it easier. So then I gradually um, connected again with my feminists. So I was three years into a job. I was starting to um, get a bit more comfortable, no longer just a junior. You know, I had some things to talk about, and people were actually listening to me. And I got this random coupon to, <laughs> to have someone, um, like a personal shopper for a day. So we went shopping and she's like, why don't you try this dress, you know? I think it might good look, at, good look good on you. And I was like, oh God, no dresses. I was forced into dresses as a child. I don't want to try it. But I did it and it looked great on me. And I experienced something maybe similar to gender euphoria. Like, oh my God, I'm femme and it feels great. And I started to wear more dresses, first just as formal on, on formal occasions, but then more and more during work as well. And I noticed that people <laughs> were treating me differently, right? Um, now I'm at the stage there where I usually don't wear trousers anymore because when I do that, I feel some sort of a dysphoria. So what happened was the male gaze, right? So <laughs> I try to avoid um, give even in even starting eye contact with someone um, because I experience harassment on the streets. Sometimes it even happens in the office. Right? You're just minding your business and then someone comes and starts um, demanding your attention because they want to talk about how you look like. In uni, I experimented with makeup and I was immediately getting lots of harassment about it, so I just stopped. So I never learned how to do proper makeup and so there was a lot of frustration. <laughs> like, how do I do this? And I got body image issues as well. Um, so this, this all played into it and it just made it really hard. And I felt like I was experiencing puberty in a way, but you know, it, it was a lot of harmful messages. And, and I guess there was some sort of conspiracy going on where when I was doing something, the reactions didn't make sense if you didn't take into account this whole system around us. So for example, Someone posts something about um, imposter syndrome on our Slack channels, and I just post an article saying that imposter syndrome is not just about low self-esteem, it's also about people telling you that you're not good enough. And it is immediately seen as an attack, right? So even posting that article just as a different point of view, because I'm seen as a troublemaker, starts this whole conversation where someone tells me that I'm taking these things too seriously, you know, and then they get a lot of praise from the guys in the room for being such a cool woman because, you know, and in that way, and then I am told that I'm being overpowering, aggressive, and all these things. But when you look at the power structures, because most of the company agrees with this flawed view that they have, I'm actually in the position of weakness here. So. The, the problem is that you constantly get told these different messages and you have to figure out what is actually true or is there even truth, like what matters and how do you inter interpret these messages. And in the end, you can no longer tell if something was actually a microaggression or if it was just something random that felt like a microaggression because there's so many things happening, you can't tell them apart anymore. Another example of 
um, privilege happening was that I was starting to speak at different conferences and these speakers were telling me, oh yeah, I have three kids and my wife, you know, takes care of everything at home and I travel all the time. And they weren't even aware of their privilege of having a person, a supportive spouse. And I was like, oh, it would be so great to have that person, but so bad for that person, unless they really love it. You know, I, I believe there are people out there that love that. Uh, but I didn't want to have that kind of marriage or relationship. <coughs> okay, so again, there were some consequences to changing my gender expression. And some of them were just being overlooked. So when I, I had to basically demand a seat at the table with conversations that I had to contribute something to. And that happened at work a lot. And you'd sometimes you get told, oh, you just have to behave differently. You have to use the proper channels. You have to suggest your ideas in a nicer words. They tell you that it's your fault and you have to do things differently. And I really believed that message. I tried so many things. The only thing that worked was telling a male colleague about my idea because then the idea got implemented. <laughs> you know, if, because I really cared about that idea. <clears throat> so that is a big problem. One of the interesting talks I saw recently is um, this one about how shaving my head made me a better programmer. Um, it was someone actually shaved their head and because she appeared to be more masculine, she was suddenly taken more seriously. So it's just a personal experience, but it shows like how much the gender expression also matters. And of course, this ex uh, experience of I look like an engineer um, was a big hashtag after this woman was featured on an ad campaign for a company and people just didn't believe that she was an engineer just because she looks like this. So the problem is when you start behaving more feminine or more code coded feminine, it just doesn't fit within the existing system. And I feel that IT industry is um, a special case because we praise people that behave very, I would say, narcissistic or a bit pathologizing, but people that have um, over um, a too big image of, of themselves. And we praise bad behavior and we elevate people that uh, behave very badly just because they do good work. And we believe that it's a meritocracy, you know, where the good stuff rises, and we miss all these important small bits that make this, would make this industry so much better. So, and it's really a, um, caught between a rock and a hard place because I can also not behave like a man because this will also be seen as bad, right? So I can't do the lean in thing where I behave aggressively because I'm a woman, I'm not allowed to do that. So I can't do either, I just don't fit in. And for me, the biggest realization was even if I try to be one of the guys, I will never be the same way accepted or seen as competent when I enter a room. So I just stopped trying. And I already mentioned this burden of having to do all this emotional work of explaining to people um, and educating people all the time. Okay, so let's go to the part of my learnings because hopefully that will be a bit useful. I have um, talked to my therapist about the three strikes rule. <laughs> so um, I tend to trust people a lot and you know, give them benefit of the doubt and explain their actions away and give them lots and lots of chances. And at some point, it becomes unhealthy not to spot the toxic men that are around me. So if I spot them, and it takes me a long time to do that, to try to spot that earlier is if someone misbehaves, like they get a strike, like a mental note. And at some point, I just stopped trying with them because it's not worth it. Then watching my energy levels. So we already talked about the spoon theory, but it, I think this applies to almost everyone that um, it can be so exhausting to be on top of things all the time and to have to pretend to be someone that you're not. And it can also be exhausting if people see you as this inspiring role model like when they expect you to be on top of things all the time because you're this inspiring role model, you know, and you better not have any flaws. Um, the other thing is that um, you don't have an obligation to disrupt this industry in terms of their view on gender. So you can also just live your life and that's what I'm trying. I'm just trying to live my life, expressing myself and normalizing this idea 
that it's okay for femmes to be in this industry. But you're not obligated to do that and you can pick your battles and you can take a break. So it's really a personal decision and self-care is really important. Um, again, the emoji looks very different <laughs> here, but it's fine. So um, there's uh, the Slack emoji of rising hand. It's actually a woman, so I use that when someone others me. I just put that emoji there. It's like a woman who raises a hand as a reaction. And sometimes people are like, oh, uh, I guess. It's a very subtle way of reminding people that I'm here, that I'm also part of this. Um, yeah, two women holding hands. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can clearly see that. Um, supporting each other in meetings, elevating each other's voices, saying, hey, you just interrupted that person. I was interested in hearing what I said. Um, you can create a secret Slack group where you only invite people that you like, and where you can discuss <laughs> the stuff that happens. Like, and that's totally okay. Create safe spaces, right? Um, and be vigilant about them. Uh, you can normalize and celebrate feminists. So think about how much emotional work people do and value that. Um, people that care, people that um, care for relatives or for each other. Um, acknowledge that the soft skills are actually hard skills. That's something Aga taught me. <laughs> we'll be speaking next. And that empathy is really a, an asset. And yeah, celebrating everything that is coded feminine because it's great, it's powerful and it's, it's exciting. And whether you're femme or not, you can celebrate those parts of yourself and of others. Be kind to yourself, you know, like I thought for such a long time that everything was my fault and if I just tried harder or, you know, I should be such a better feminist, you know, but everyone else is not kind to you, um, you know, so be kind to yourself. And yeah, I did therapy. I appreciate this is not accessible to everyone. Um, it, it has costs associated and some people have bad experiences with that, but I would say that for me it really, really helped. And it's a big cost factor, but I feel it's a bit like going to the gym where you spend money to stay healthy. So I had mental health problems, but therapy helped me to deal with all these things. And I have a therapist that understands feminism, so <laughs> it's really cool that she can dissect these things. And um, there's a fuck off fund. Yeah, so saving money. <laughs> So you can, if, if a work situation becomes really, really bad, so you can leave and you have the power to leave and you're um, not dependent on other people. I used to spend a lot of money on other people and then I said, okay, stop. I need to save up some money, like a cushion, because you never know what can happen. And sure enough, I had a problem at work, had to leave my job and I didn't have any money, <laughs> but I did it anyways and it worked out okay because I had a support system. But it's always good to have that in the back of your mind so you don't have to worry so much. If you can afford it, I know there's lots of people who don't have that luxury, but if you can, save up some money. Support networks are really important. Um, also, don't be afraid to call on people in your network, like to ask for help. They can always say no, or if you do it in a consensual way. And hold allies accountable. Ask them <coughs> to do the one-on-ones, you know. Uh, ask them to do the menial work. <laughs> so, um, allies can lend privilege. If there's a if you have a mentor, for example, that is a white man, he can get you interviews or connect you to people or get you to speaking at a conference and all these things. So calling on that and holding that accountable and not, um, yeah, and getting them involved in all this work. And independence is great if you can manage it. So <coughs> I recently became a freelancer and now I can leave any job, you know, after the contract and I'm not obligated to, to stay there. I know this is not every accessible to everyone, but it has been so important for me. If you can find little pockets of independence, maybe, then, you know, try going for that. And, yeah, sorry, I was going really fast, but there's so many things to cover. Just want to take a moment also to look forward, like, where am I going next? So I feel that we have made some progress in this industry, and we should be able to celebrate that. So, for example, Things like Slack and um, emojis are normalizing putting hearts on everything. And you know, it's, it's become pop culture and it's okay. And uh, selfies have become a thing. And you know, there's, there's more stuff in culture that um, like helps us. And uh, sexual harassment is talked about and people seem to care more than they did a few years ago. Supportive groups are forming everywhere. And there's also online communities that help. 
And I really love that coding schools are getting more and more attention and more and more people go through that because they have a much more diverse group of people and they're less exclusionary than academics. So I'm really glad about that. I also found an amazing meetup called Queer Code London with, together with Daniel. And maybe you can give a short shout. Thank you for supporting me that you're all here. Great. Um, I would in invite you to find supportive communities or to, if you have the energy, to make your own. And it's been so lovely to have a community that is like-minded people and safe environment. I'm still left with a question as I was examining myself more and looking more at what I was doing. Do I actually define 100% as a woman? And it's very frightening, right? When you've been all the time advocating for women and feel like you're representing women and then you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I recently found out that there's um, even all different kinds of genders. So I'm now looking at what is demigender, maybe I'm demigender, I don't know. I'm just saying there's a lot out there and it really is great to be able to express myself. So thank you so much for listening. Wow. <laughs>